I wanted to start there because, again, uh, as I said last week, I think for those of you who, who want to do kind of your own little study on the side, comparing what's going on to Paul to Jesus, I mean, there are so many similarities. So I think it's really good for you to see all of those. Uh, and so Luke chapter 4 is one of these stories. It's like, wow, it's exactly what we're talking about in Acts. So uh, go to uh, verse 16, please. Verse 16. So Luke 4, verse 16. So it says, He, that's Jesus, went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and, recover, and recovery of the sight of sight for the blind to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Verse 20. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Wow, that's a pretty bold statement, right? Verse 22. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked. So you can, you can read into that question what, whatever you want, okay? Um, but verse 23, Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physicians, heal yourself. Do not hear. Uh, do hear in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Verse 24, I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, catch this, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Where's Sidon at? Up in this area, up here. Who doesn't live in Sidon? Jewish Israelites don't live there. He's gone to a Gentile place. Um, verse 27. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleaned. Only Naaman, the Syrian. Where's Syria? Way up here. Who doesn't live there? Israelites, Jewish people. Gentiles live there. What is Jesus clearly saying? I, I find this interesting. He was kind of bold in saying the scripture, talking about me. People are like, oh, okay. Sounds fine. But then he starts talking about God's prophets going to the Gentiles. Now what happens? Verse 28. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. What did they want to do with him once they threw him down the cliff? That's where you then stone the person, okay? Does he get any kind of trial? Is there any kind of discussion? Is there any kind of, well, let's take a look at, you know, what he's saying is true or not? No, they just go crazy and want to kill him right there on the spot. Verse 30 then, but he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. How many times did they try to kill Jesus? before he was actually crucified. Six, seven, eight, something like that. Many times, right? What did Jesus always do? 
He just slipped away. Why not? Why wasn't he killed? It wasn't his time. Okay? Who's in control of this whole thing of Jesus? God is, right? Father. And we're going to see that with Paul as well. So let's go to, um, I don't have it up there. Uh, let's go to Acts 23 now. So now I'm going to follow on your handout, Acts 23. So in Acts 23, uh, let's review a little bit from last week. So they want to kill Paul because he keeps talking about preaching to the Gentiles, preaching to the Gentiles. The crowd turns on him. They drag him out of the temple area. They want to stone him. And the Roman guards basically save him. So now he's kind of in jail with the Roman guards protecting him, okay? But it's not a very good scene. You're in jail, and there's a whole mob of people out there trying to kill you, okay? This, this doesn't look good for him. So uh, Acts 23, verse 11 now. Uh, the following night, so he's in jail, right? The following night, the Lord stood near Paul. All right, stop right there real quick. How do you picture that? Because again, I, I look at a lot of commentaries. There's a lot of different opinions of what stood next to Paul. Do you think Jesus literally? <laughs> another. Uh, That's what it says. Or was it a vision? Because I, I hear that. I, I would go with that. That's what it says. I'm going to go with that. But that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Was he physically right there? Or was it simply a dream? I don't know. But that's kind of cool. Jesus stood right next to Paul in this incredibly difficult time in Paul's life. And he says, take courage. Isn't that wonderful words? You and I need those words all the time. And then he says, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. He's in jail in Jerusalem. He's got a mob of people around him who want to kill him. And now Jesus is saying to him, you're going to end up in Rome. A lot of thoughts go through my head on this. And I kind of want to hear some of your feedback. Um, how it, because this went through my mind. I wonder if Paul's thinking to himself, wait a second, hold on. I'm in jail in Rome. Jerusalem. Or Jerusalem. <laughs> and Jesus is saying, I'm going to go to Rome. There's a mob of people here in Jerusalem. There's lots of them out there. And Jesus is saying, I'm going, how in the world is that going to happen? I mean, I believe Jesus, but I just don't see how that's even possible at this moment. What is Jesus talking about? That, that must have been going through Paul's mind. And so I wonder how many times that goes through our mind. I know exactly what Jesus asks of me. I know what he wants me to do. I know the expectations. But how am I supposed to do that? I, I had a, um, this is several years ago, I, a, a mom talked to me about her, her situation in her life. She was a single mom. Her husband had died. Four kids. And she had cancer now. What was going through her brain? God has given me these four young men to raise. How am I supposed to do that when I've got my own health issues? She knew what she was supposed to do, but she didn't understand how am I supposed to get this done? We go through that a lot of times in life, don't we? So I kind of like to hear a little bit of feedback here. Well, she had, I think, an advantage over what where my faith is because he was actually struck and down and met the Lord, you know, but on the road. Yeah, so, yeah, like, Acts 9, that incredible vision. Yeah. So to me, it's like, okay, well, that, that happened to me. So, okay, if you say I'm going to be there, then I'm going to be there. But it seems like it would come easier for him than to me. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of see it also as a, as we, a, 
I'm sorry, we, but we have this with us yeah, everywhere we go. Because I've had this discussion with a lot of people. Was it easier to be an Israelite in the Old Testament when they saw God's, you know, thunder and lightning and plagues and all that stuff? And Or is it easier to just have God's word right here next to me? So, I, yeah, I've had that discussion a lot of times. So, he has now God's word on it. The Jesus word that you will testify about me in in Rome, and in one sense, it's like I will protect that. That is a promise of protection. Yes, yeah, and and, and that's going to be uh, my next note there. A number two. This is really good news. What's not going to happen to Paul? <laughs> it's not coming to a horrible end here in Jerusalem. Okay, so that's really good news, and I'm sure Paul was also very excited. Because what got Paul excited? His ministry. And now he knows it's going to continue. And it's going to continue all the way to Rome, which isn't, he knows that's probably going to take a long time. So his ministry, yeah, it continues. Jesus himself came and said, you're going to Rome. Yeah. How can you say, um, no? <laughs> or not, not no, but you know, that, that doubt of how. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Lord. I don't know how, but it's going to happen. Yeah. So that and, must and have been just an amazing moment for him. Thankfully, God does not give the details that you're going to go to Rome, you're going to board a ship, the ship's going to be destroyed. <laughs> right. Yeah. You're going to be hanging onto a log yeah. in the middle of the ocean. Just trust me. Gonna be okay. I'll get you there. You'll get to Rome. Yeah. It, it, it's not like you, you you've all taken your kids on family vacations and the car breaks down and all that kind of stuff. How are we actually gonna get there? It's not like me as the dad saying, I have no idea either. How we're gonna know. It's yeah, Jesus has got he's got the wheel. It's gonna happen. Okay. Alright, so let's move on. Uh letter B then. Uh, Acts 23, verse 12. The next morning, the Jews formed a conspiracy. All right, so I'm going to stop right there. What have the Jewish group of people who hated Paul done so far? It's been more of a mob, right? Now what are they doing? They're organizing. It's a plot. So my thought was, what would be worse? Dealing with a mob or dealing with people who are actually putting a plan together, a devious plan together. So my, my thought is on the Roman officials at this time. Okay, this is, a, this is a different kind of crowd we're dealing with. And bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. Jokes on them. I would be the smart aleck guy in the back of that group going, wait, 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 wait. No eating or drinking or drinking a little sack. <laughs> um, uh, what what is that telling you about their their vow to kill Paul? <laughs> I mean, I was talking to the students about we were talking about fasting in in, uh, in class the other week. Um, and I said, I don't think I've ever missed a meal <laughs> my whole life. Because then I asked them, do you guys eat breakfast? And they're like, none of them eat breakfast. Oh. They're just five minutes to make some toast. Um, have a banana and some orange juice, coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, lunch, I don't think I've ever skipped. Even at, even at school, when you're really busy, you got to eat something, right? sandwich or something, and then obviously going home for a meal. So this is really serious stuff to say we are not going to eat or drink, uh, that you are very, very focused on what you're going to do here. So verse 13, then more than 40 men were involved in this plot. All right, so I've got that uh, for number one, dagger men. I mentioned that last week. I looked this up a little bit more. Um, apparently, these were like the, 
the ninjas before you and I watched old, you know, 1970s movies about ninjas or whatever. Um, this was a pretty uh, reckless group of people in different countries, terrorists, basically. Again, what they like to do was in a big crowd, I'm now thinking Ryder Cup, thousands of people all around, and what will they do to a Roman guard? Just stick the guy and then go off into the crowd. It's that type of, of group, okay? Very, very dangerous, well-organized, and now they're plotting against Paul. Uh, verse 14, then they went to the chief priests and elders and said, we have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Verse 15, now then you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext, a plot, right, of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. So what's the, now we got the chief priests and the elders, the religious leaders are in on this. Summon Paul so we can question him, question him a little bit more. The Roman guards will bring him, and that's where we'll get him. This is a genius plan, right? So, um, so at one point now, the Roman guards then are warned about this. All right, they're warned about this not to take Paul to the Jewish leaders. Okay, so let's go down to uh, letter C. Starting at verse 23, uh, so I'm going to skip all of that. And so um, the, the, the Roman guard now is, he, he knows what the plot is. I'm not going to let Paul get killed. So I'm going to now change the game plan. So letter C, verse 23. Then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, Get ready, a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at 9 tonight okay so it's a quick getaway in the middle of the night i want to stop right there think back to jesus's trial kind of putting you on the spot a little bit I, I talk to my students about this all the time Pilate ended up doing what with jesus washing his hands right and just handing him over to the crowd can you think of any other things Pilate might have been able to do instead of just washing his hands and giving Jesus up? Can, can you think of a different plan he might have been able to get away with? I, I My students come up with some wild, crazy stuff. They just held him in prison. Just hold him there until Passover is over? That, that, that's a good, good thought. What else might Pilate have done? Wait to see there. <clears throat> Yeah, let, let's call in Caesar, and maybe Caesar can uh, can deal with this situation uh, instead of me. I, I've had kids say, well, why don't we dress someone up like Jesus and hand that guy over? And I said, that's actually brilliant, because you know who actually teaches that? That's one of the theories of many Muslim leaders, because they don't believe Jesus went to the cross, so who went to the cross? So somebody else, okay, might have got handed over like that. Um, or a lot of them say, why didn't he just sneak him out in the middle of the night? Okay, so lot, lots of, but that's what this Roman officer does. He's going to sneak to, uh, Paul out in the, in the middle of the night. All right, verse 24. Provide mounts for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. I'm going to explain Governor Felix in a little bit. All right. Uh, verse 25. So he writes this letter. Uh, so we now learn this Roman centurion's name in verse 26, Claudius Lysias. Uh, to his Excellen excellency, Governor Felix. All right. So let's go on to turn my page. Uh, this greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and they were about to kill him. That's important. Remember that point right there. They were about to kill him. Very important point. But I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he is a Roman citizen. Very, very important point there. 
I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to their Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. Exactly what Pontius Pilate was saying with Jesus. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. Um, by the way, who did uh, Pontius Pilate hand Jesus over to because he didn't want to deal with the problem anymore? Herod. Yeah, Herod, Herod Antipas, right? <laughs> and so we, we kind of see that as well. All right, so now Jesus is going to be sent to this governor named Felix. All right, so on your handout, I put on the back of your handout a, uh, a family tree of, well, most famous there is Herod the Great. So I'm going to give you guys a minute to just kind of look over that. I'm sure you see some familiar names. At the top there, you can see Herod the Great, five wives. And then you can see through his different wives, his many, many sons. Most famous of his sons is Herod Antipas. Uh, what, what's Herod Antipas famous for, besides not really doing much with Jesus in the trial? Who did he kill? John the Baptist had him beheaded. You can see that. And then we start seeing the lines getting a little bit confusing. And then way down at the bottom, we see Drusilla. Um, and she marries Felix, procurator, proconsul, governor. It's all kind of the same title. All right. It's the same. So Felix is the new Pontius Pilate, basically. Okay. There was somebody in between the two, but that gives you a little more insight. But where is Felix headquartered at? He's headquartered at Caesarea. Okay? Not in Jerusalem, but in Caesarea. And up on the, not up on the screen. Uh-oh. Oh, there it goes. There go. Nope. Uh We've got to do technology. This is always. Keep logging. <sighs> um, so that's Caesarea. Um, and, and so Herod's built up most of this. Now, this actually, and I'm sorry if you guys can't see it very well over there, um, is not actually either. The right time or be Herod did a lot of stuff. This is amazing what he did. It's a sunken harbor. It's amazing what he did there. Okay? But he also built a palace over here, and this picture doesn't show the palace like it should. Okay? A praetorium. But it, it is an amazing city that Herod, King Herod the Great, really built up. And so Paul is going to be taken to the palace, which should be pictured in there a little bit better. But it's an amazing place, okay? Um, but if you like to study royalty, you know, we always study the British royalty, right? And all their crazy stories. This is some messed up stuff here, okay? In fact, Antipas, what, what, was the, what else was he famous for besides, why, why was John upset with him? He yeah, he divorced his wife so that he could marry his brother's wife. Okay, so if you like reading messed up families, uh, read about the Herods. They're incredible. Disgusting in many ways. Okay, all right. Um, so now we are at uh, verse 31. So Acts 23, verse 31. So the soldiers, carrying out their orders, took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as 
Antipatris. Uh, the next day, they had the cavalry go on with him while they returned to the barracks. Um, so when the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. All right, so now he's the governor's problem. The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from, learning that he was from Cilicia, again, up here in Tarsus, up in that area. Um, he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered that ball be kept under guard in Herod's palace again. Incredible trust here. Herod's palace. All right. So even though Paul is from this area, he was under the jurisdiction of Felix in, in Caesarea. All right. So let's go to Roman numeral six. Uh, the Roman trial, Acts 24. All right, so let's read through that. All right, it says, Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus, and they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. All right, I'll stop there. So now what do we have? We, did, did Paul ever really get a trial in Jerusalem? No. Not really, okay? It was more of just a mob, and he did it, and let's kill him, kind of like Luke 4 was. Right? Now it's got to be an actual trial. You actually have to present charges and evidence and truth. And so just like Pontius Pilate wanted, Felix wants that, okay? This is very, very much a Roman thing. You are proven, you are, you are innocent until proven guilty, okay? Yeah, I don't know what those guys are doing right now. Wait, hold on. <laughs> Nobody said he was going to Caesarea. Uh, <laughs> number two, when Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. All right. What is Tertullus doing right now? He's a lawyer. He's buttering up Felix. thing that I learned about Felix, and you can read more about him on your own, he's a terrible leader. Okay, The only reason he got that is because his brother knew some people who got him married to Drusilla, and since she was in the royal family line, he got that position. He's an awful leader. Okay? I think so, his name is Felix Evers, isn't it? Oh, oh. oh. See, now, I'm on camera here. <laughs> I'm on camera here, and so I'm going to... Um, <laughs> and so Felix, uh, Felix has a terrible reputation. He's not someone that people really respect. So this lawyer is, is doing what lawyers do, okay? You want to get the judge on your side. Um, all right, verse 3. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. Wow, that's laying it on thick, okay? But in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. Okay, so, all right, now we're going to actually get to some actual important stuff. Verse 5, we have found this man to be a troublemaker stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. Kind of an exaggeration there. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple, so we seized him. All right, so let's go through these charges. I've got them in your notes. Stirring up riots all over the world. Problem is, Paul's not been all over the world, okay? He's been to a lot of places up here in Asia, all right? So that's a bit of an exaggeration. But let's think about the, the, the trouble. What was Paul going around doing? He would go to the synagogue, right? That's where he always went to first. And he'd talk about the prophets of the Old Testament pointing toward Jesus. And then he'd talk about Jesus. And what would the people in the synagogue want to do with Paul? Throw him out, kill him, whatever. Okay? Is Paul creating the disturbance? 
Not really. All he's doing is what? Talking about scriptures and saying it all points toward Jesus. If you want to disagree with him, that's fine. Okay? But he's not creating the problem. It's the response of the people that's creating the problem. Yeah, but I'd say on, on the surface, Paul's creating the problem because people are reacting to what he says. He is, you know, if you reread the transcript, he's he's the one with the incendiary talk. I was going to give the example. Um, when you look on college campuses today, how do a lot of college campuses, um, not all of them, but many of them, how do they keep certain speakers from coming to their campus? They're talking about something that is controversial, which you can label anything controversial. And so since that's going to get certain people upset, now we have to hire a whole bunch of security, which we can't afford, so we're not going to let that speaker come in. Okay, This happens more than you might think out there. All right, This other person who we like what they're saying, we'll let that person speak, but not this guy, okay? So I, I'm, I'm going to be more on the, yeah, Paul is bringing up something that is uncomfortable, and certainly the Jews are very, you know, uh, expressive and, and enthusiastic and all of that stuff. Um, but is, is he going around trying to create, is that his intent? Is he trying to create a problem? Okay, so that, that's kind of where I would be at. And I think we're going to see some evidence to show that a little bit more. Paul's going to say that. Um, next one, a ringleader of a sect. All right, so a study, a little bit of history. Was Judaism an illegal religion? No, not at all. It's protected, okay? To the Romans, it's weird. But what did Rome think about pretty much every religion out there? It's fine, right? You can worship whatever you want. Polytheism. You Jews are kind of weird with all your little stuff going on. But Judaism was protected. What did they at first think of Christianity? Pretty much an offspring of Judaism. Um, when, when does Christianity become um, illegal? Not, not till many, 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 many years later, okay? So at this time, um, the only time that there was trouble for Christians, because it was so new, would have been with Nero in Rome, but that was local, okay? That had nothing to do with what's going on over here in this part of the world. So this sect of Christians, he's trying to make it sound like they're just a bunch of thugs going around creating problems all over the world. And it's not. It's a very, very false portrayal. Okay? And then, this is really interesting. It says that he attempted and even tried to, attempted to desecrate the temple. What's interesting about that wording? He didn't actually do it. He just attempted to. That's a big difference, isn't it? You could say that about a lot of things. We do it all the time. Allegedly. allegedly yeah, allegedly. allegedly. And, and so, uh, why, why did Tertullus say that? Why did he not say he did desecrate the temple? Because no there's absolutely no proof, yeah. and they know by now, it's been long enough, they got nothing on that. Okay? Because what was Paul doing in the temple? He was going through that Nazarite vow thing. Okay, you don't do that without going through all the ceremonial stuff uh, that, that that ceremony requires, okay? All right, so those are his charges. All right, so let's go to the back side of the sheet now. So page uh, six. Page six. All right. Oh, and, and one more. And that centurion guy... Sorry, one more charge. That centurion guy in Rome, while we were trying to question Paul, they arrested Paul. They prevented us from giving him a proper trial. 
Is that what happened at all? <laughs> no. The centurion is trying to keep the mob from killing Paul. So it's, again, a very false portrayal of what was actually happening in Jerusalem. All right. So, letter B, um, verse 24. All right, or uh, chapter 24, verse 10. Uh, all right, so when the governor motioned for, for Paul to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been a judge over the nation, so I gladly make my defense. What did Paul not do here that Tertullus did? He gets right to the point, okay? He's not going to kiss up to Felix at this moment like Tertullus did. Paul is not going to act like a typical lawyer. Verse 11, you can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago I went to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. What is Paul saying? When I got there, it was only a few days before, okay, Everybody saw what I was doing for those few days. I was out in the open. I was out in public. I'm doing the Nazarite vow thing. There's nothing hidden or secret in those few days that I was there. Just talk to the witnesses. Isn't that what Jesus basically said? As they were questioning him, the Sanhedrin was. Just go talk to the witnesses. They all heard what I was saying. Verse uh, 13, and they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way. All right, so uh, Christianity was not called Christianity yet, okay? And so this is one of the early names of the Christian movement, followers of Jesus, the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written by the prophets. And I have the same hope in God as the men. And there will be a res that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. What is Paul saying? Here's what I do. I go and I talk about the Old Testament prophets. And then I try to connect it to Jesus. And I love to talk about the resurrection. That's all I'm doing. There's nothing devious. There's no plot. There's nothing of me stirring things up. This is what I do. I talk to my people, the Jewish people. We all have the same hope. I've just connected it to Jesus because of the resurrection. All right, so verse 17. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. What is Paul saying? In no way was I coming to Jerusalem to stir things up. This is what I do. I bring people stuff to make their lives better. Okay? This is what we do all over the place. This is, this is the only stuff. We're, we're not going around causing problems. Verse 18, I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. Again, talk to the witnesses. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia, specifically Ephesus. Ephesus is going to be up in this area, northern part of that Greek, Greece area. Um, if they have any... Uh, who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. But they're not there. So verse 20, Or these who are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence, it is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial here. So again, what is Paul saying here? I'm preaching the resurrection. I'm preaching about Jesus. Their response is the problem, not what I'm preaching, okay? Not what I'm preaching. It's their response. All right, so, uh, so letter C now. 
uh, starting at verse 22. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way. All right, why is Felix well acquainted with the way? Drusilla is what? She's Jewish, and as a Jew, she would know about some of these stories about Jesus. Okay, so Felix is actually kind of interested in this. All right, he's, he's listening because he's heard about these people. All right, uh, adjourned and uh, with the proceedings. When Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom. All right, so basically house arrest and permit his friends to take care of his needs. All right, so now Paul back in jail, but it's not a uh, not a typical situation. He's got a lot more comfort in this, but he's still stuck there. Now he's stuck in Caesarea. Verse 24, several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. And this is what I love about this story. What does Paul always do wherever he's at, no matter what situation? He's always talking about Jesus. He's talking about the resurrection. That's his whole function and purpose in life. So verse 25, as Paul discoursed on righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid. Isn't that an interesting response? Isn't that how a lot of people are when they hear God's word? He was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. All right, so I'm going to do, um, let's go for this. I'm going to do chapel tomorrow with my students um, at the high school. So we have, what, 850? Rachel, 850? Is that where we're at right now? A little over. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot. You've got all the data. Don't you? How, how many are churched? Less than 50? They're not, they're not hearing God's word unless they hear it. That's what we assume when we say unchurched. They're not hearing it unless they hear it at the high school. Okay, so they're going to be at our high school two, three, four years. What's my message to the kids tomorrow? I hope you're not going to be like Felix. <laughs> what did Felix say after how many years? Is Paul going to be there? Does it say it later on? I think it says two years. Verse 27. Verse 27. When two years had passed. Two years. You get to hear. What is Paul always doing? Teaching about Jesus. The resurrection. And he tells him, stop right there. Go away. Leave me. I don't like this message. And that's the prayer that I hope all of you have for our students at Milwaukee Lutheran. A lot of them only hear the Word of God at school, and I don't want them to leave after two, three, four years and say, eh, whatever. I don't want any of that. Okay? A huge important thing. So, I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to end on a good note, though. That, that, that's not going to be my only part of the message. We're going to talk about Incredible conversions in the Bible, uh, Lydia, uh, people like that, the jailer, uh, in was it Philippi? Okay, things like that. All right, so it's going to be, and that's what I want for our students. But I don't want them to be Felix, okay, who just kind of said, "That's enough, leave me." Okay, all right, verse uh, twenty-six. Then, at the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. What was Felix more interested in? Apparently, the the uh, tradition, if you want to get out of jail, if you want the judge to set you free, you got to give him some money, okay? So he's hoping Paul will do that, and that's just not going to happen. Paul will not do that. Uh, so he went for him frequently and talked with him. So in that two years, he kept going back to Paul, back to Paul, back to Paul. Wanting money, Paul keeps talking about Jesus. And that's not, that's not uh, what's going to happen. So when two years had passed, Felix was 
succeeded by Portius Festus. Felix was a bad ruler. So basically, what did they do? They fired him. Okay. Now we're going to get the next guy in, Festus. Uh, but be because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. Pretty good political move, right? You don't want to upset the locals, so don't start letting their local criminals free, okay? Keep Paul in jail. Paul's going to be in there a little bit longer, okay? So when we come back next week, then, the trial is going to continue, but this time under the next governor, his name is Festus. Festus. Great name. Felix Festus. You guys need his, his grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say you had to do it. You, you got your, you got your, Rachel, you got your kid named yet? <laughs> there, there's that. It's a girl. <laughs> now I'm trying to think, how can she, Felix, Priscilla. <laughs> Felicity. 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 Okay, all right, let's end on prayer. Dear Lord, thank you again for uh, giving us so many opportunities. There are so many people around us each and every day that need to hear your word. And they are right in front of us a lot of times. Help us to be like Paul, uh, just speaking the truth. And as uh, we receive different responses to your truth, help us again to continue to do your work, to not give up. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would penetrate the heart, the mind, the ears of the people hearing your word, so that they uh, so that they come to you, so that you come to them. Help us again to uh, support all the different ministries out there that reach out. Also, pray in your name. Amen. 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 All right. Have a good day.